Gracious and loving Lord, we just thank you so much, so, so much for this day, uh, for what this week brings, all of the emotions, the, the roller coaster of joy intertwined with sadness that we take in and process what this means for us as Christians. Lord, as we gather tonight on this holy of Thursdays, may you be with us. May you speak to me through my words. May you speak through the act of communion, through the act of service, of hand washing, and just um, place your, your Holy Spirit in all of our hearts tonight. We come to you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. All right, so as, uh, as Gordon was saying just a few minutes ago, uh, explaining what, what Maundy Thursday is, I am assuming that uh, most of you know, and that's why you're here, but maybe you don't for sure. And uh, you'd be surprised, there's a lot of people that I still have conversation with. I'm like, yeah, uh, don't you know Thursday is, is, is Maundy Thursday? And they're like, what did, did you say Monday Thursday? Like, that, that doesn't make sense, right? Like, who wants to have two Mondays in a week, right? So people aren't real sure, some people aren't real sure what that means. And so there are even, there are other names that get even better to, uh, to, for, to name Holy Thursday. So it's also called Covenant Thursday. Uh, we have Sheer Thursday, which means to free from guilt. Uh, it's also called the Thursday before Easter, which it is, that makes sense. Um, it's also called the Thursday of Mysteries. Sounds quite mysterious. And it is the first day of the Holy Triduum. That's my favorite. But us calling it Maundy Thursday, I think, really tells us the significance, right? Maundy, is, as Gordon said, comes from the Latin word mandatum, which means commandment. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. What is that final commandment? that Jesus gave us that holy Thursday. So we'll set the scene. Jesus is gathered with the disciples in the upper room. And we read from John 13, verse 1. We'll take a look at that. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So right there from the start, Jesus knew what was about to happen. He knew the hour had come. He knew this night is different. This foot washing is different. And so once again, we have Jesus breaking the rules. In the middle of the supper, Jesus gets up. He takes off his, his outer robe, ties a towel around his waist, pours water into the basin, and begins to wash the disciples' feet. So we'll read verses 2 through 5. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Surprise, shock, confusion would have filled the room. Imagine this scene. This is your master, your teacher, your Messiah, your, your Lord, washing your feet. Then he gets to Simon Peter. He goes to Peter, knowing Peter is going to betray him. And yet he is still offering this act of humility. We read in verse 6, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Peter doesn't like it. He doesn't know what to think. Good old Peter, right? Always in the middle of things, 
always questioning, but he has what he thinks good reason to question. It would have gone against the status quo. Peter knows that the servants wash the feet of their master. Masters don't wash the feet of servants. Teachers do not sit at the feet of students. And certainly the Messiah does not touch feet. But Peter's world is structured by dominion and power and hierarchy. And foot washing perfectly lays out the pecking order in society. It's a very visible way to see where your position is amongst other people. When you got to someone's home, you walked in, the foot washer would come. And so right away, you would know who was at the bottom of that pecking order. And it was usually done by slaves or women or children. Those who had no social status. The lower class washed the upper class. Our world is not so different. Those who have power, wealth, and position are served. Those who don't are servants. Peter's world is being changed, and he doesn't like it. He doesn't understand it. Think about the last time your world changed or threatened to change, and all of what you thought the status quo and the hierarchy began to unravel. Even when it's for our own good, we resist. It's like we have this automatic response system to buck up against change before we've even laid out the pros and cons. And people often know our response. They hear it loud and clear. We express our complaints or at a minimum, our grumble. And so Peter responds, You will never wash my feet. He's saying, I'm going to hang on to what I know, to what I have. If you wash my feet, it's going to flip my world upside down. Today in the church, we might liken it to a, we've never done it that way before, and we're not going to start now. And so Jesus replies in verse 7, You do not realize now what I am doing. But later, you will understand. And on in verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus is always showing us one example after another of what God being in the world looks like. And it's usually not what we expect. Jesus wasn't that warrior king that some wanted, but the servant, the foot washer. And I don't know about you, but lots of people really don't like feet. And our feet are pretty clean. For Peter, God being in the world in the form of a foot washer looks like nothing he has ever seen. Peter might be wondering if this is how the Messiah acts. What will be expected of the Messiah's disciples? Of me? Whose feet am I going to be asked to wash? And the answer he doesn't want to hear is that it's everyone's. Everyone's feet. So think of all the feet, the people that pass through our lives or that we drive by in a day, a month, a lifetime. How have we treated them? The dirtier they are, the worse they are treated. 
How will we treat them? Maybe we ignore them. Maybe we step over them with our own feet. So many feet, young, old, tired, lost, angry, hurt. There are all sorts of feet. Feet that have walked through the valleys of life. Feet that have trespassed. Feet that have walked on holy ground. Feet that have carried good news. Feet that dance to a different beat or walk a different path. Those are the very feet Jesus washed. They are the feet of all the world. They are the ones he commands us to wash. And they are really no different from us. For we too have walked through the valleys of life, down in the dirt. Our feet have trespassed into places they shouldn't. Our feet have been on holy ground. Our feet have carried good news. And our feet have sometimes walked a strange path. And so you see, it's not just about recognizing God is in the world. It's in being spectators of Jesus' life and of his death. It's about when we wash the feet of the world, we move from being spectators to participants in Jesus' life. In the limited time Jesus had left on this world, in his farewell speech, he shared the most important thing, the most important thing by which humankind should live by, a new command. On this day that Jesus ate his last meal on death row, he shared with us his final speech and gave us this new commandment. Verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. May it be so. May it be so. Let us pray. Lord God, as we sit with those words, those final words, those words of truth, the last commandment, the ones by which the disciples hung on by which they were challenged by, by which their world was turned upside down. Go and wash everyone's feet. Lord, you say the same thing to us tonight. Go and wash everyone's feet. Love one another. These are your words. Your words when you are limited with time. The words that you thought to be the most significant for generations to come. The ones that can change the future. And so, Lord, as we continue to meditate on this tonight and into the coming days, May it sink in to our heart and into our soul and into our doing. Be with us as we continue to move through this service, through Holy Communion, and of washing one another's hands tonight. Continue to be with us. In Jesus' name, amen.